within them is because of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Uh, that's the same thing for us today. When you're saved, when you trust in the blood of Christ as atonement for your salvation, you have the indwelling Holy Spirit. That was impossible for every believer to have the indwelling Holy Spirit before um, the cross because of that enmity that was between God and man. A holy God cannot dwell inside unholy man. But because the sin debt was paid through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, now today we have God, the Holy Spirit, dwelling within us to guide us. And similarly for Israel, when, they, when God brings in the kingdom, he does say in verse 33, after those days, which is a reference to after all of this stuff takes place here. So then once the second coming of Christ comes, then he can set up that kingdom. He can write the law on their inward parts, put the Holy Spirit inside them, and then they will obey it. They will obey it perfectly, and God can dwell with them. So your fill in the blank is that for Israel... This means going from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant and from man being responsible to God being responsible. And that's the difference. Man was responsible under the Old Covenant, just like with a child. The child was responsible for not touching the hot stove, not running into the street, going to bed at curfew or you know whatever rules you have. And because the child is responsible, they often will break those rules and be in rebellion because they want to do their own thing. Similarly, Israel, given a set of laws under the Mosaic Covenant, they were responsible. They blew it, just like children. They wanted to do their own thing. That's why they were called the children of Israel, and they rebelled. But, when, but because of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, God can now dwell within them and take away that rebellion because God is a part of them, and He can cause them to walk in His law. So, the reason that they're able to fulfill the new covenant is because God is responsible. And the great, great thing about it is, you know, God didn't want to create a bunch of robots who would just do whatever they wanted to do. He created man with a free will. And the difference is, those who are under the new covenant are the ones in Israel who have used their free will to have faith in what God has told them. So these are people that have made the free will choice to serve God, to be His people. And then God says, okay, since you've made that choice, I'm going to take the flesh out of the way because that's what's really stopping you from serving me. And then I'm going to dwell within you and then you'll serve me. Uh, so that way God ends up in the end with people who serve Him perfectly but out of a free will choice to do so. So now if we go back to Revelation chapter 12, um, that's the significant part really there is what God does, creates the nation of Israel, and because Jesus Christ comes, makes that sacrifice, He comes through the line there. He is a Jew. He comes through Israel, so uh, He is able to save them from their sins. And so then in verse 3 now and verse 4, we're going to see uh, the rebellion here by Satan, what it all started there. Verse 3 says, there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads, and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. If you go down to verse 9, we can see who that great red dragon is. Revelation 12, 9 says, The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, his angels were cast out with him. So your fill in the blank there is the dragon is the devil or Satan. So in verse so in verse one and two you see the woman who appears, you see the child, and he's brings redemption through his death on the cross there. And now we've got the nation of Israel. But now in verse three we've got the opposition. We've got Satan here, and. Um, I wrote in your outline that he appears, the dragon appears in Genesis 11, verses 7 through 9. That's when God um, gives up the nations at the Tower of Babel to their own lust, to uh, give them over to a reprobate mind, and they serve Satan, basically, while God builds up the nation of Israel to be his people to reconcile the world back to himself. And then I wrote on your outline, and We'll see. We've looked at this before, so we won't go there, but the seven crowned heads 
on the dragon there in verse 3. That represents the seven kings in the first half of the tribulation period. And the ten horns represent the ten kings under the Antichrist in the last half of the tribulation period. And that comes from chapter 17, verses 10 through 14. We went over that last week, I believe. And then as an interesting side note, you can look this up on your own time, I wrote down that the ten kingdoms, the ten kings that are under the Antichrist during the last half of the tribulation period, those ten kingdoms are listed in Psalm 83, verses 6 through 8. There's a list of names there. And uh, if you look at them and you try to compare it to the current geography in the world, you say, who are these nations? I have no idea. I couldn't tell you. But um, you know, just as an interesting side note, you've actually got those ten kingdoms listed for you there in Psalm 83 that are going to be under the Antichrist. Uh, and he'll basically have the territories there divided into these ten regions, those ten kings being over those regions, and then the Antichrist ruling over those ten kings. Now in verse 4 there in Revelation 12, we see that it wasn't just Satan himself who rebelled, becoming the great red dragon, but he convinced some of the angels to rebel with him. Chapter 12 verse 4 says, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. That reference, um, I said the stars of heaven, that's a reference to the angels. And if we just go back to chapter 9, we can see a verse that will indicate that. Chapter 9 and verse 1. Revelation 9 verse 1. It says, The fifth angel sounded... And I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. So there's a star fall. And, but then it says, And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So it's a star that falls, but yet it refers to the star as a he. To him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. Now, if you drop down to verse 11, uh, this person, you get a little more information about this star. It says, They had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollon. So, in verse 1, we saw a star fall from heaven. He's identified as a male, so it's not just a star, it's an actual being. It says, To him was given the key. And he opened the pit. Well, if he, verse 11 says, they have a king who is the angel of the bottomless pit. Well, the angel of the bottomless pit is the one who got the key of the bottomless pit, who opened the bottomless pit. So, what we can conclude then is a star, an angel, verse 11 says, he, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. So, we can conclude that an angel, in this case, can also be a reference to a star. And EC had a question, I think, a week or two ago, referencing you know, the host of heaven. Well, the host, or the stars of heaven here. And, and so, in Revelation 12, verse 4, when it says that his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth, we can conclude that in Satan's initial rebellion, when he decided, I will be like the Most High, I will sit on the sides of the north, I will be God, when he made that declaration, he got a third of the angels to agree that, hey, yes, Satan is going to be God, he's going to overthrow God, so I want in on this. And so a third of the angels are convinced by Satan to join his forces, and those are referred to as devils in your King James Version. A lot of people call them demons, uh, but they're really fallen angels. And this is the verse that we find out that a third of the angelic realm sided with Satan, while two-thirds stayed with God. But on top of that, if we go over to Daniel chapter 10, we can see from Daniel 10 that not only... Was it, just, it wasn't just a third of the angels that rebelled, but Satan convinced nearly all of the top-ranking angels, or the archangels, to rebel with him. 
uh, your fill in the blank is that Satan got one third of God's angels to rebel with him and all but two of the top ranking angels, all but two of the top ranking angels. Those are the archangels. In your Bible, um, the only angels that are given by name, well, except the one we just read, Abaddon, but the other ones, uh, Gabriel and Michael. You don't hear of any other angels on God's side ever named. And the reason is because all of those high-ranking angels sided with Satan except for Gabriel and Michael. Uh, we see that here in chapter 10 of the book of Daniel. Notice in verse 1 in Daniel 10, at the very end of the verse, it says, He understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. So there's this vision that was given to Daniel in Daniel chapter 10. And in verse 2 it says, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. So he gets this vision. It's not a good vision. It causes him to mourn. And during the whole time he is praying about it, he wants to find the answer to that vision. And um, if we go down to verse 12 there's this angel who is Gabriel the angel Gabriel comes to Daniel and in Daniel 10 12 it says Gabriel talks to Daniel it says then said he unto me fear not Daniel for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God thy words were heard and I am come for thy words um, angels are able to travel at lightning speed, um, you know, like a flash of lightning. They can just go really quickly. Daniel starts praying about the vision, and from the first day that he started praying, God says, okay, Gabriel, go give Daniel the understanding of this vision. He sends him off there. But yet Daniel was mourning for three weeks. The reason, we see here in verse 13, it says, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. Prince of the kingdom of Persia is uh, one of those archangels that is on Satan's side. And it says, But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And I remained there with the kings of Persia. So he had to wait. Uh, in other words, there's only Gabriel and Michael of the archangels who are on God's side. And so, be, because Satan has those stronger angels, um, he has to wait three full weeks before Michael is freed up to help him. Michael is doing some battle of his own, I guess. We, we're not told. But it takes three weeks before Michael is freed up so that he can go help Gabriel there. And you look down in verse 21 of Daniel 10. Daniel 10, 21, it says, But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but... Michael, your prince. And that's where I get the fill in the blank that all but two of the top ranking angels rebelled against God here because only Gabriel and Michael are holding in the scripture of truth. And that's why it takes Gabriel a full three weeks to get to Daniel because there's this these battles. And even though Satan's forces are outnumbered two to one because Satan has the stronger, the archangels and God only has Michael and Gabriel, it took some time there. Um, and that's why in Revelation 12, in verse 7, when there's war in heaven, it's Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. Again, we see that archangel Michael there. Um, so, we're out of time, but I will just, if we go back to Revelation 12, we'll read the last part of verse 4, and then we'll pick up there next time. But I did want you to see that not only is it just a third of the angels, but it's a lot of those high-ranking angels that Satan took with him. So in Revelation 12, 4, it says, His tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And the point is, it's really up to Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ fails in his mission, if he sins, if he's killed, if he's destroyed, then Satan wins the battle. And the kingdoms of the world do not become the kingdoms of God. So he's there ready to devour the child as soon as it was born. And I wrote on your outline that in Matthew 2 we're told that Satan has Herod kill all Jewish males born 
during the time of Jesus' birth. Um, it's no accident that Herod makes that proclamation that all those males are to be killed. Satan wanted Jesus Christ to be killed. And in fact, when he did crucify him on the cross, he thought that Satan thought that he had won because he said, I couldn't kill him at his birth, but now I've killed him at the end. He wasn't able to redeem Israel like God had promised, so I've won. But little did he know this part here, the mystery, and that by dying on the cross, not only did Jesus save Israel, but he also saved the Gentiles and reconciled the heavenly places back to himself. So we'll pick up there next week with the child there being born and, and what all he does because this is really... You know, God starts his plan of attack with the nation of Israel, with this woman. But it all comes to naught if it's not for this child, Jesus Christ, who provides that sacrifice for their sins. Or else they are still Satan's lawful captive and the kingdoms of this world still belong to Satan. So next week we'll get the good news of what Jesus Christ did to save them. So with that, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you for your, your plan, especially the mystery that you kept this plan of dying on the cross secret so that you could so Satan would have him have the Lord Jesus Christ crucified so that not only would you save Israel according to prophecy there but you'd also save us today according to mystery that you reveal later and help us to have faith in that program because we've seen it we've seen the evidence that you've delivered that you will continue to be faithful to your promises and we know that you've promised us heavenly places positions of authority there so let us hold fast to that those promises having faith in your word especially to us today in paul's epistle so that we may live for you trust in it have faith in it allow the holy spirit to teach it to us we thank you for that in jesus name amen